Hi, my name is Carol Duffy. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Biological Sciences, and it is my honor to introduce Julia Stevens for her TIDE Talk. Julia is one of my favorite graduate students in our department. I've known her for several years, and it's been a lot of fun watching her mature into an independent scientist as she worked on her dissertation research. The work Julie is going to present today in her TIDE talk started as a side project, but has led to the development of some revolutionary experimental strategies for asking important questions in the field of invasion biology. Julie has a bright future in front of her, and the University of Alabama is proud to call her one of our own. So here she is. Take it away, Julia. So I hear it time and time again. I hear it at weddings. I hear it at reunions. I hear it every time I meet someone new. I wait for it. During the friendly chit chat shared among generally nice people, I brace for it. As this new friend will eventually ask me, So, Julia, what do you do? I'll smile and I will respond, Well, new friend, I am a marine biologist. The eyes of my new friend inevitably will light up as they tell me stories about how they too wanted to be a marine biologist growing up, how they drew dolphins in the margins of their books, and how they still watch Shark Week every single year. <laughs> I will usually mutter something nice in return, and we'll go on chatting. I won't bring up the unending hours that I spent studying in undergrad, the late nights and weekends I work now during my PhD program, and the countless failed experiments. But I don't bring any of this up. Because no matter how stressed or tired I get, being a marine biologist, it's pretty awesome. Over my last five years here at the University of Alabama, I have gone here to Roatan, Honduras. I've gone here to teach a class in Exuma Caves, Bahamas. I've gone here to Chechong, Taiwan. I have gone here to carry bouquet Belize. And I have gone here to the only operating underwater laboratory in the world. This is in Key Largo, Florida. But I don't bring, I don't bring any of this up. And we'll go on talking about the weather or the Alabama Crimson Tide or the latest episode of The Voice. I don't bring any of this up because frankly, I get a little bit sad. Not sad that their childhood dreams didn't come true, because if everyone's did, this would be a world full of firefighters and princesses. <laughs> but I get sad that they are so far removed from that dream that they can't believe that someone with that career is standing right in front of them. That biology still actually matters outside of the medical field, and of course the Discovery Channel. So sometimes that friend will be especially curious about marine biology, and they'll work my work back into the conversation, ultimately asking me what it is I study. And that is what I want to share with you all tonight. I study the invasion of the Pacific lionfish. It's a gorgeous fish. In 1985, it was the first recorded sighting of a lionfish off the coast of South Florida by local fishermen. Seven years later, 1982, Hurricane Andrew decimated South Florida destroyed an aquarium, and released six more lionfish into the water. From there, lionfish have spread up along the U.S. eastern seaboard, all throughout the Caribbean Sea, and in just the last two years or so, up into the Gulf of Mexico, beginning the worst marine invasion in recorded history. So what is an invasion? An invasive species is removed from its native range and placed in a new area where it has detrimental effects on the new ecosystem. Whether they are terrestrial or aquatic, all invasive species tend to share seven common attributes. When I began my work, lionfish had already been recorded as possessing five of these. Number one, similar environmental conditions between the native and invaded range allow the fish to stay within their physiological limits. On this graph of sea surface temperature, one of the main drivers of organismal health, you can see in the Atlantic and the Caribbean, the water temperatures are quite similar to the Indo-Pacific, where the lionfish is native. Number two is the absence of powerful predators. While the spines of the lionfish are gorgeous, they are highly venomous. 
And there's nothing in the Caribbean that consistently eats the lionfish, likely due to these 18 venomous spines. And no, I've never been stuck. Number three is exhibiting unique behaviors. Lionfish use hunting techniques never before seen by native Caribbean fish, as this poor wrasse in this picture is about to find out. These hunting techniques have led to a nearly 80% reduction in native fish recruitment on reefs where <coughs> lionfish are present. Number four is being a habitat generalist. Lionfish have inundated nearly all available coastal marine habitats in the Atlantic. They can be found in deep water, in shallow water, and swimming out in the open. They can be in reef crevices, reef walls, seagrass beds, estuaries. And in this picture, you can see that they're in mangroves. Mangroves are a really important nursery ground habitat for coral reef associated organisms. And number five is an increase in biomass. Lionfish in the Atlantic are more than twice the size that they are in the Pacific. In fact, they are becoming so fat that they are now exhibiting signs of liver disease. In this picture, you can see fatty deposits around an engorged liver of a lionfish that's been dissected. Welcome to America, lionfish. <laughs> but when I started my work, the sixth and seventh attribute had yet to be established in lionfish. And this is pathogen release and symbiont retention. And so this is where my dissertation work came in. I have studied the bacterial communities associated with the invasive lionfish. First, I compare the bacterial communities of the lionfish to native Caribbean fish. Now I know a data slide, yuck, but I only have a couple. So each dot on this, uh, or each triangle on this graph, represents the bacterial communities of a single fish. In the green circle, we see native Caribbean fish. Three different species, no significant difference between their bacterial communities. In the orange circle, we see lionfish, highly different than the bacterial communities associated with the Caribbean fish. Interestingly, is I was not able to find any known pathogens on the lionfish. The native fish, riddled in pathogens. So while we can't say that they've been released from their native pathogens, we can at least say that they don't seem to be susceptible to the common Caribbean pathogens that are all over our native fish. So pathogen release. The seventh attribute was symbiont retention. So the next thing I did was I compared the bacterial communities of lionfish between their native and invaded range. Now here the upside down and right side up triangles all represent lionfish but some from their native range in the Indo-Pacific and some from the invaded Atlantic. And there's no significant difference here, indicating that the lionfish have retained a poor bacterial community no matter where they are located. So what, are that, what was that community doing? So the next thing I did was I isolated the bacteria. I isolated 149 different cultures. And I tested them against six known and common fish pathogens. So what this plate is, growing in a lawn are, is a common fish pathogen. And seated in these little discs is the chemicals excreted by the lionfish bacteria. And you can see zones where the pathogens were not able to grow. So it does look like that core bacterial community is helping the lionfish fight off of those pathogens in the Caribbean. Therefore, my dissertation research indicates that lionfish do exhibit those final two attributes. But of course, if I stopped there, the story wouldn't be complete. Because as of right now, we don't know the role that lionfish play in these patterns. So my next step is to do a genome-wide scan for lionfish genetics and look for single nucleotide polymorphisms. This is where you guys start taking notes for the quiz later. <laughs> so this type of technology was originally created in the medical field. It was used to look for genetic signatures for human diseases. So a genome is made up of base pairs. You have to think back to your intro biology courses. These A, T, Cs, and Gs. These are called nucleotides. And as this individual reproduces, it passes that genome on to its offspring. And then the offspring reproduces, passing its genome on again, and so on, until eventually, a random mutation finds its way into the genome. 
Do you see it? I'll help you out. No, I'll help you out. <laughs> this random mutation is referred to as a single nucleotide polymorphism. So this technology was first used to look for the genetic dis uh, signatures of human disease. But not all SNPs, those single nucleotide polymorphisms, have ill effects. Some, most, are neutral. They have no effect on the host whatsoever. And many are even beneficial. This allows them to build up in the genome and be, serve as kind of a family history of the individual. So I am now taking this idea and using it for lionfish. So now we have a fish, we have its genome. This fish reproduces, and eventually a SNP will work its way into the genome. And then that fish with the SNP goes on and it reproduces. Eventually another SNP finds its way in, then that one will go on and reproduce. And eventually we get these different populations. We can use this idea to look for differences between different groups of lionfish. So now I'm now using this idea to look for the possibility of multiple introductions of the lionfish into the Atlantic, to try to trace dispersal patterns throughout the Atlantic, and then finally to see whether or not the differences in the lionfish genetics drive patterns in the bacterial community genetics. So now I am using a state-of-the-art cutting-edge technology and scanning the genome of nearly 200 individual lionfish from throughout the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans to look for all of these patterns. So typically about this time, my new friend is desperately searching around the room for someone to come save them from the crazy scientist. But I have at least for a few minutes made that person think about that childhood dream and have some more wonder about the possibilities that are still out there to be discovered. So I want, what I want to leave you with as you go out into the world and be whatever it is you are going to be is this. Remember that wonder of nature that we all felt as children. And no matter what you do, support the sciences. And if your future child says that they want to be a marine biologist, that their dreams can come true too. Thank you.